good day everyone so good day masters today we will be having a discussion on some concepts of advanced parasitology as a part of your course in advanced microbio and para of your msm so what concept of advanced parasitology will we be having a short discussion today so this is about new diagnostic tools for intestinal parasites so we all know that the morphological determination has been a routine laboratory diagnosis especially among um, population like us where we are still developing our economic state and so my molecular and other serological diagnos diagnostic tools are not that um, practical and cost effective so the advantage of the morphological di determination through microscopic examination either stained or direct smears or wet smears is that it is appropriate for resource limited health systems and is somehow sufficient enough in diagnosing parasitic or intestinal parasites. So just like in our case here in the Philippines. So in this um, in this picture here is a slide, you can see examples of intestinal parasites that are stained. So dito yung um, jarja and some cyst stage in histologic tissue. So, um, examples of some parasitic infections that are being detected through morphologic determination in microscopic examination are the following parasites. So, dito, we detect these parasitic infections through a trained technician. So, gagamit tayo ng microscopic examination by using stool samples. So it is somehow easily differentiated. So yung letter A, so this um, this parasitic infection, itong parasite, this is an example of, ano nga to? This is a, this is an egg of a schistosoma mansoni parasite. So, ito, nakikita natin yan. Pero not that common here in the Philippines. How about this um, parasite picture in letter B? So, this is an L1 stage larvae of strongyloides tercoralis. So, we prefer diagnosing strongy by uh, checking for larvae in the stool. Tapos ito... Jargelum diasists, tapos color violet siya, or color amber, sorry, hindi violet, amber, because um, of the iodine stain, in the an iodine stain smear, and this one naman is oocyst ng cryptosporidium. So, pag cryptosporidium, we detect it through a modified steel Nielsen stain smear. So these um, intestinal parasites are commonly or sufficiently diagnosed through microscopic examination. However, um, scientists have been trying to develop or check the validity of diagnostic tools for intestinal parasite because somehow um, we need a certain form of standardization and uh, standard molecular diagnostic, diagnostic methods that will not be that subjective or can adapt to certain levels or intensity of infection of parasites because not all the time um, enough ang microscopic examination, especially if yung sample not that viable, I mean, matagal before na submit sa lab, or low ang, ang 
infection rate or infection severity. So, ang sensitivity might not be enough for us to early diagnose a certain disease. So, we have certain categories of types of patients wherein there are practical applications of new diagnostic tools for intestinal parasitic infection. So, yun yung isa sa mga i tackle natin in this lecture. So, for those low-risk patients, so sino yung mga low-risk patients? Example ba nito is tayo. So, not really. Somehow, we belong to the high-risk patients or high-risk group of patients because we are in a developing country with some areas na may problems pa din with hygiene practices. So examples of low-risk patients are those patients na uh, belo they belong in a developed country and they are less likely of being exposed to an area with endemic parasites. So why is it important to have a diagnostic tool for these types of patient because uh, microscopic examination might not be enough kasi uh, it might not be that sensitive and it might not be appropriate for those na low risk ang population kasi hindi ganun karami yung um, trained technician to diagnose these types of infection. So we still have to provide diagnostic tools for these types of patients because we still have to treat them. So ano ang isa sa mga common na ginagamit is a multiplex PCR or multiplex RT-PCR. So we, the common uh, multiplex PCR targets are the Giardia, Lamblia, Cryptosporidium species, and Entamoeba histolytica. So for us, somehow, these um, inf uh, parasites commonly cause infection in our population. So some travelers na exposed to this infection might not have that uh, increased degree of infection. So hindi masyadong reliable if we will just use picalysis or microscopic determination. So checking for fecal DNA might be more sensitive, more specific, and less labor intensive for these types of patients or low-risk patients na less likely ang exposure to these infections. So these three parasites are somehow considered as globally the most important diarrhea causing intestinal protozoa and there are studies that compare these protozoa multiplex PCR in a routine setting with microscopy or um, antigen detection. So it was noted that fecal DNA is more appropriate for these types of patients. And di ba minsan, um, we give metronidazole na. So we check for the presence or the success of therapy after metronidazole treatment. So how do we check that? If we give metronidazole or treatment to these patients, that degree of yung makakakakita tayo ng parasite cyst or trophozoid in the tissue is not sensitive na. So we check for DNA. So when we treat with metronidazole, if successful ang treatment, yung Georgia Lamblia DNA becomes undetectable after one week. So meaning there should be a rapid clearance of DNA in fetal samples following successful therapy. So one country, so in the Netherla Netherlands, they use RT-PCR as a primary diagnostic tool to examine stool samples for parasitic infections in low-risk patients. So for these types of patients, this um, 
new diagnostic tool is important because we we do not readily observe the presence of cysts or um, other stages of these parasites kasi a low risk type of patient sila. So next group of patients are your uh, schistosomiasis na infect. Ay, sorry. Next group of patients are your travelers and immigrants. So we have two common parasitic infections that are present in these types of patients. So meron tayong schistosomiasis which is second only to malaria as one of the most frequently diagnosed parasitic disease in a febrile returning traveler. And uh, schistosomiasis is often acquired by those travelers and immigrants by bathing in different rivers or contaminated lakes. So, nagkakaroon ng acute tatayama fever ang mga returning travelers or mga immigrants. So, tatayama fever happens with abdominal signs and symptoms. Tapos, uh, it, the symptoms occur only after two to six, two to six weeks of exposure with the um, parasite. So there should be enough or adequate diagnosis and treatment so that there will be prevention of late genital urinary, gastrointestinal, or neurological morbidity. So microscopic detection is still considered a reference standard. Pero if the group of patients we consider are those that have low intensity infections like that of traveler if magma microscopic detection tayo we will have low sensitivity and we might not detect the presence of schistosomiasis so there have been serological tests that were developed and some of them are assays based on the egg or worm extracts so, yung zero, zero or zero conversion might take four to eight weeks or later. So, yung um, parang sensitivity of our serological test will still range at a level of 40 to 80 percent. However, for these types of um, patients or group of patients, yun pa rin ang most suitable diagnostic test that are currently available. Yung serological tests for schistosoma um, detection. Minsan, we try to detect schistosoma DNA in feces or urine and it has been being developed in some laboratories and is um, observed to be more sensitive than egg microscopy in these types of patients. However, um, for some types of schistosoma na infection, for example, schistosoma mansoni, yung DNA in serum is reported to be more sensitive as a diagnostic tool than serology in the diagnosis of acute trisosomiasis. So we are still trying to develop these types of study and hindi siya perfect kasi there are cases na we still detect positive results even after treatment because there might still be a release of DNA from degrading schistosomes, just like in other viral infections. Na kahit na na-treat na yung infection, nagpo-positive pa rin sa DNA or nucleic acid detection because of um, degrading viral remnants. So yun yung isa sa mga problem 
in trying to check for DNA of some schistosoma species. So for other yung other infection of travelers and immigrants, yung strongyloides. So your strongyloides is um, diagnosed through microscopic detection of larvae. So it is still considered as a traditional reference standard. However, sometimes even with multiple stool specimen or multiple stool sample, nagkakaroon pa rin ng um, low sensitivity result. That might be because of certain uh, excreted larvae might be in low um, low population. So, yung ating mga uh, detection is not that sensitive for these types of patients. So, anong ginagawa ngayon for detection? Serological assays are now the first choice diagnostic test for screening of patients na at risk of developing strongyloides. And I mean, at risk of developing strongyloidiasis na na, na, na under nitong type of population, mga travelers and immigrants. So there are different in-house and commercial, commercial antibody detecting tests that are being developed Pero it's not that common here in our country because we are somehow um, equipped enough to do the microscopic detection itself. But for those the travelers and immigrants, they have to um, develop other tests because of low sensitivity. So, pwede ba tayong mag-RT-PCR for that? testing strongyloides DNA. So yes, we can use RT-PCR for detection of strongyloides DNA in stool samples. And somehow, in other European reference centers, it is being used as a routine diagnostic test. And kailan ba nagiging useful ang molecular diagnostic procedures? So it is useful for those um, group of patients na may possible na low grade infection so if positive serology but yung microscopic procedure is not um, possible to be performed we do real time pcr so yung real time pcr pwede rin yung gamitin in um, sputum or bronch alveolar lavage fluids in checking for patients if they have disseminated strongyloidiasis. So, this um, RT-PCR is more sensitive than routine microscopy. Pero hindi siya enough na one testing lang. We usually do several repeated procedures just to sure, be sure na excluded ang infection. So that is um, one of the ways of detecting strongyloides in low intensity or low grade infection group of patients. So next, yung geohelminths tapeworms, and foodborne trematode. So, ito, ito yung mga ascaris, tinia, hemonolipis, diphilobotrium as samples of these types of parasites. So, syempre, we do microscopic detection of eggs in feces and sputum for some of these um, parasites. And these can still be acquired by travelers and immigrants who go to areas with endemic na um, infection. So sometimes for those of patients na may low intensity infection, serological tests are being performed by reference laboratories. Okay, and we do complementary microscopy 
but that might be less sensitive. So, nagpi-PCR ba tayo? Some uh, reference clinics try to apply PCR, but we do not use them in routine clinical diagnostic. So, kailangan um, properly discussed ang protocol if we are considering um, these types of population. Itong travelers and immigrants. Okay, so what is our parasite of the day? So, si Jarja duodenalis, also known as your Jarja lamblia and Jarja intestinalis. So, remember this parasite paved the way of being um, popular ng microscopic exam kasi ito yung isa sa mga first parasites na na kita ni Anton Van Leeuwenhoek when he developed microscope. So your Jarja duodenalis is a major cause of a parasite-induced diarrheal disease or itong Jarja lamblia. So it is found worldwide but the prevalence is higher in low-income countries or developing countries like our country. So paano nga ba ang route or route of infection of this parasite so this have this has a fecal oral route and ano ang source ng jarja that is yung contaminated water or food whether in as direct contact with infected people or animals so yung cysts like other protozoan will survive in the feces and then if the feces will and contaminate food or water source, they will become infectious immediately. And when we ingest them, it will undergo um, existation and the trophozoites will emerge from these cysts and attach to intestinal epithelial cells of the upper small intestine or yung duodenum. So they will replicate there extra cellularly. And it will now complete its life cycle by forming cysts or encystation in the lower intestinal region. So yung replication ng jarja, lamblia, can result in profuse fatty diarrhea in infected individuals. Pero possible ba na may asymptomatic cases? So yes, it is still possible. That's why sometimes nagpapatest lang ng stool exam as a routine procedure tapos may na-check na jarja. So ma magugulat na lang yung patient. Bakit sila may infection? Eh wala naman silang symptom. So possible ang asymptomatic cases. So, one of the major clinical symptom of jargal infection or jargasis is steatorrhea. So, meron tayong fatty type of diarrhea. So, ano ba ang major drug being used for treatment ng ating jarja? That is yung metronidazole. So, metronidazole is being used for 5 to 10 days. Somehow, um, nagkakaroon na rin ng resistance. So, that emerging resistance is a problem. Kasi ito yung isa sa mga common na um, common na anti-parasitic or anti-protozoal drug na less lang ang side effects. So, that is a major problem. So, that is the life cycle of your Jarja lamblia or Jarja duodenalis. So, paano nga ba nagkakos ng pathogenesis ang Jarja? So, the Jarja infections have a wide range of symptoms. So, pwedeng abdominal cramps, nausea, fatty diarrhea, pwede rin subclinical. And most of the time, yung chronic infection, yun yung nagkukos ng disturbed intestinal balance with changes in the microbiota. 
So there will be um, some effect ng villus blunting, pwedeng nutrient malabsorption, leaky gut, and stunted growth for those na mga children pa lang. So yan ang, ang isa sa mga wide range of symptoms, some of the wide range symptoms present. So the trophozoites of these parasites will adhere diba, to small intestinal mucosa. So they will leave a detectable imprint when they detach from the intestinal epithelium. And that imprint will now um, yung parang detectable imprint ng trophozoites somehow um, if affect the pathogenesis of Jarja, some but not exactly proven. So once the trophozoid will infect or attach to the intestinal lumen, it will trigger the host immune response. And then when there are interaction with these uh, factors, the intestinal microbiota or the normal flora will contribute to various manifestation. So ano example sa mga um, natitrigger na host factor. So further release of antibodies like IgA and when the parasite or the trophozoid will detach from the microvilli, it will somehow release chemokines that will call on some immune cells to the site of infection. So this entire immune response is um, contributing to the to the different na manifestations of the disease. So one of the important important parts of the pathogenesis of Jarja is the um, arginine consumption. So the Jarja will have arginine consumption, so there will be a reduced nitric oxide production. So when that happens, there will be reduction also of proliferation of the intestinal epithelial cells. So si Jarja, Meron siyang, um, meron siyang enzyme, yung arginine deaminase enzyme that is secreted when they interact with epithelial cells. And it will be responsible for the um, depletion of arginine. So this arginine depletion also impacts the immune response of um, the host to Jarja by increasing the release of a certain cytokine, which is tumor necrosis factor alpha or TNF alpha, and decrease in some interleukins, for example, interleukin 10 in some immune cells. And this will cause a decrease in the proliferation of T cells here in the intestinal epithelial cells. So increased levels of arginine deaminase in Jarja parasites is considered a virulence factor and is important in the energy or nutrient production of the trophozoites. So if there are further release of chemokines, there is a possible um, degradation of the integrity of the intestinal epithelial cells and it will cause apoptosis. 
So apoptosis of cells in any part of the body will um, produce permeability. In this case, intestinal permeability, it will trigger bacterial and antigen translocation and disruption of the different borders. For example, yung apical junction complex and yung mga basal uh, basement membrane connection so that will be disrupted. So pag nagkaroon ng ganan, there will be disruption also of the mucin integrity dito sa apical surface of your intestinal epithelium. So nagkakaroon ng alteration in the microbiota and there will be decreased um, chloride in the cell because they will be released in the surface and that will cause a type of diarrhea present in Jarja infection. And also, it will also trigger um, antigenic variations of the Jarja. That's why not easily detected by our immune system. So that is the inf inflammatory process of um, diarrhea in Georgia, Lamblia, or Georgia duodenalis na infection. So, those are somehow some of the new trend, trends of diagnostic tools in parasitic infection. Oops. So, um, somehow, we are trying to develop um, alternative ways of detection for cost-effective screening of fecal samples if we cannot do microscopic examination. So, meron tayong mga multiplex real-time PCR. We use to screen entamoeba histolytica and stranguloid sterculalis so that there will be a further development of a semi-automated and fully automated na high throughput platforms for simultaneous detection not just viral bacterial including na rin yung mga parasitic enteropathogens since we are um, entering a molecular um, era in the microbiology scene. So this is somehow an algorithm present in detecting parasitic infections in the feces. So based on the clinical information provided by the physician, the laboratory can decide kung what routine diagnostic care can be assigned on that sample. So, pwedeng PCR screening for most relevant parasites with additional PCR and serology, serology tests depending on the patient's characteristics and the laboratory capacity. Pwede rin naman na we perform in-depth research including um, correlation of microscopic exam and nucleic acid testing or serology for some rare parasite infections. So, yung information or decision making will be depending on the clinical sample and can be discussed with a parasitology reference center. Pero yung um, decision making most of the time is um, implemented by the physician and correlated with the clinical laboratory team or the microbiologist in charge. So, depende if walang presence of parasites detected, we will check for eosinophilia or high level of IgE and clinical symptoms like urticaria and passing of worms or proglotids as uh, noticed by the patient. So those are, this is another um, algorithm or flowchart in laboratory diagnosis of parasitic infection. 
especially in um, non-endemic areas of the um, population na hindi common. So thank you for listening for new diagnostic tools in parasitology in common intestinal parasites.